So today I'm chatting with Clotilde Longley. Uh, Clotilde is one of our leading physical oceanographers who researches how our oceans connect with our climate systems. Um, so welcome. Can you please start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey so far? So I'm an ocean scientist, so I'm working on ocean circulation and ocean dynamics. Um, I did all my training, including my PhD, back in France. That's where I'm from. And my physical oceanographer journey brought me to Hobart in Tasmania in 2008. And then I never left Hobart. Um, I did multiple jobs um, in the last, you know, almost 15 years. Um, I had 10 years of postdoctoral work and research assistant work. Um, and during that time, I was doing large scale climate viability type of work. And then in 2008, I joined a coastal modeling team at CSIRO. And since then, I've been working on um, coastal environment and impact uh, in multidisciplinary project. That's great. So has there always been that sort of interest in the coastal environment? So I've been working on multiple scales. So what I'm passionate about is the ocean circulation. And I did all the different type of ocean, all the different scale. Um, I did the Mediterranean Sea circulation. I did the South Atlantic. I did the Southern Ocean dynamic of the Antarctic circumpolar current and the overturning circulation. I did a bit of tropical dynamics with El Nino. And, oh. um, and so I've been, I did climate scale all the way to coastal scale. So I'm just really passionate about how it impacts our climate and our everyday life. That's great. So there's a little bit of a little bit of all around everything there. <laughs> yes, in terms of scale and type of ocean. Yeah. And in terms of, I suppose, ocean circulation, is it possible for you to give just like a brief one minute explainer um, for those without, I suppose, a science background and who don't know much about how oceans work? So I think the easiest way to explain ocean currents is more at very large scale. So in the big basing the large ocean what's happening is we have mainly winds um, that are dri driving the ocean circulation so at the scale of the ocean basin you've got big gyre of ocean circulation so big circulation in that circulate at the side of the basin and that's really due to the to the wind forcing um in in, in part so What's happening, you've got those big westerlies around the 40 degree north or 40 degree south, and, and they're going to try to push the water in one way or in another. And, and that's when you start this gyre circulation. So in the northern hemisphere, it's going to be in a clockwise circulation. So you go from the equator up to the North Pole, and then you go in a clockwise circulation all around. Um, Closer to Australia, so in the South Pacific, what's happening is that you've got an anti-clockwise circulation in the South Pacific gyre. So you've got warm water coming along the equator and then going all the way down the east coast of Australia, that the East Australian current, and then it's circling around near the Southern Ocean and going back to South America. So that's a large scale gyre circulation. Um, and those ones, so that create our very strong western boundary current, which for us is the East Australian current, then bring warm water all the way down the coast and even all the way down to Tasmania. Wow, I think that's really interesting to think about um, where water has been, like next time you're in the ocean, you're swimming in water that's essentially been all around um, Australia and it's come from all these different and been through all these different, I suppose, movements and patterns. It's really interesting. Yeah. So can you take us through, I suppose, a day in a life as an oceanographer? So I model the ocean. So most of my days are actually in front of my computer looking at um, ocean models. So ocean models, it's um, a tool we use to mimic the ocean circulation. And in a way, we sort of project our ocean onto a grid. And on this gridded ocean, you look at the evolution of current and temperature and salinity. So if you're interested in the global ocean, often our grid is the size of 10 of kilometers or so. 
because we can't go higher resolution. We don't have computer um, that are performant enough. But when you go to the coast, uh, you can go to much smaller domain, and then you can start to go to 10 or 100 meters resolution, depending on where you are. And you sort of looking at the circulation at that scale. So you've spent, as you say, like most of your days at a computer, but you've you've been to Antarctica, right? There's still some some yes. field work involved in your position. Yeah. So I've been I've been um, helping all the observationalist colleague as well. So um, I get the longest journey I did at sea was during a campaign we didn't to go to the equator. So we did a long transect in the ocean, and that's a repeat transect that scientists are doing as often as they can and then they share the information across the international community and we did it transect and during that time you usually working shift shift work so right. i was from 2 a.m in the morning to 2 p.m in the afternoon and then there's mm -hmm. another team you know, catching up 2 p.m in the afternoon all the way to 2 a.m in the morning and yeah, during wow. that time you just stand you do stop along your transect and you try to sample the ocean all the way down to the bottom. So you've got a rosette, which is a, a instrument with bottle that you drive all the way through the water column and you collect water with those bottles. And then you analyze the water sample you take from that rosette on board the ship. So my job was to help with the rosette, collecting the water, and then I was doing the salinity analysis in between. Yeah, okay. And so when you're looking at the water samples you were doing salinity what does salinity tell you about where the water has been and its movements so to understand the movement of the ocean there's a lot about the wind when you're close to the surface where when you start to go in a deep ocean it's becoming more about the density of the water so density is a function of the temperature and the salinity of your water and so heavy water is going to go to the bottom of the ocean where light water is going to come to the surface and it's a mix of temperature and salinity so you need if you want to be light you have to be warm and fresh and if you want to be heavy at the water drop you want to be cold and salty and then you're going to drop to the bottom of the ocean and another thing you trace when you look at those waters sometimes is oxygen so when you put all that together, temperature, salinity, oxygen, CFCs, you, you've got that and other information that you can get out of the water sample, you actually can um, use your detective work to trace where it's coming from. Yeah, that's so cool. That's really interesting. And so what is the link between your research and the broader picture? So especially at the coastal scale, you always, always and often work in multidisciplinary team. So at the moment, my main project is for the Great Barrier Reef. So I'm the sort of physical oceanographer looking at the circulation and helping others understand the connectivity between the different reefs. But really all the work we're doing is to inform management and better management of the reef um, and adaptation. So I'm working with a lot of um, ecosystem modeler and biogeochemists and water quality people. And um, it's really just a big team that are trying to put it all together to improve the health of the reef and, and try to have a picture of what's happening today and what's going to happen in the near real time or tomorrow. So it seems like in the scheme of things, like a big puzzle, how can we save our reef? And you're one of those pieces contributing to all the other pieces of research that are going on. Yes. That's great. So the next thing I wanted to just ask about was, seeing as you ended up working in STEM, is it pretty safe to assume that science is your favorite subject? So I sort of knew pretty early that I wanted to become a physical oceanographer. Like I was set to do this when I was 18. So I think it's pretty young to, to know what you want to do in life. Although I'm pretty sure I didn't know exactly what it entailed completely, but I wanted to become a physical oceanographer. And I think since my younger age, I always loved puzzles and problem solving. So uh, I guess going more to high school, it become geometry and all the demonstration you do when you do geometry. I love the complexity and the solving of problem going from one law of geometry, using them all, comparing them to find an outcome. 
And I guess when going to university, it became clear that it was something that you could do with the law of physics a lot. And I think that's why I was, you know, I love the ocean, but a lot of people, when you say, oh, you love the ocean, you're studying animals. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I'm studying the circulation of the ocean because I was, I loved animals, but I was fascinating by the law of physics and how you can understand how everything works just with equations. Like from that, that's a mark of, I suppose, any great scientist is that problem solving, essentially that's what science is, isn't it? It's just solving problems. Yeah, so, so yeah, solving problems using every tool you've got in your toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. So my next question was just about, is there an exciting advancement in your field that I suppose you're looking forward to seeing or being involved in? So, you know, when you work in, in, in sort of ocean climate science, it's not always um, super positive. Uh, so at the moment, one big event is that we've got another mass bleach bleaching event that just happened in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it's been, you know, the number four in six years. So it's in a sense, it's quite an emergency for us, but that's really something that driving me and driving all my other colleagues to try to save it and do better. Um, so that's sort of, you know, the emergency we've got in the background, uh, trying to save the reef uh, as quick and as fast as we can um, with, with the tool we've got, which is really yeah. about you know, trying to understand the circulation of it, the connectivity in between all the different reefs, um, how saving one reef could then help a lot of other reefs along the Great Barrier because they're connected together, um, mm -hmm. how we can move coral species from one spot to another uh, so they're more resilient to to heat and and all of those, you know, adaptation work we can try to do. And I suppose um, that leads on to another question I had was just working in the field that you are, there is a lot of, I suppose, doom and gloom that's often um, accompanies like climate change research. How do you deal with that? I think it's, it's some days it's quite negative here and, and, but you can only control what you can control. And um, I'm a physical oceanographer. I can't control the carbon emission in any ways. What I can say is what the impact of it and try to deal with it the best that we can. So what I can control is um, try to inform my ecosystem colleague the best as I can about the connectivity and the ocean current and how it work. Um, also, I can also inform in the Great Barrier Reef how the upwelling are working. So that's when you bring cold water from the deep ocean all the way to the surface. And somehow those upwelling, they work with the wind and they work with the tides. So it's it's not an easy process to understand. Um, so you need this knowledge about ocean circulation to understand where they happen and how strong they are. And bring that knowledge to the people then then can use this information for down the track for moving corals or for ecosystem health and well-being and things like that. So really focusing on what I can do rather than yeah. stuff that is out of my control, really. Yeah, I think that's really good advice just for, um, I suppose, anyone out there with the climate grief um, and anxiety. That's a really great message. Mm. What has been your experience working as a woman in ocean science or STEM more broadly? Well, being in a woman in science is not always easy, but I think science is not easy for everyone. Actually, it's, it can be a very tough environment. Yeah. Um, it can be highly competitive and there are often, you know, not a lot of position and money for everybody. So that's where the competition come in. Um, and be, you know, very competitive is not often a woman strength. Uh, for me, a top value would be more collaboration and networking and do a lot of stuff all together. And sometimes it's a bit counterintuitive when you think about competition and working all together. But a good thing about science is that you need collaboration to move forward. Um, and that's what I'm trying to focus in on. I'm trying to not too much focus on 
competition side of things and I'm just trying to focus on networking and collaboration and I think that's how you move forward just again just control what you can control if people are competitive yeah. I can't I can't do anything about it however I can be collaborative in my own ways yeah absolutely and with that is that I suppose the advice you would give women looking to go into ocean science Something that really helped me as a scientist is to find a good support group, a good network. And, and, and nowadays there's a lot of women in science type of network. Um, there's one for the Great Barrier Reef, the, the, the women in the Great Barrier Reef network, you know, and, and there's a good proverb that we've got going around in those groups is that it's a, actually an African proverb that means if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go with others. And that's something I kind of remind myself each time that I found things that are a bit tough. You know, I just remind myself of this. We're stronger together. And if needs be, I go back to my support group and ask for advice and, and support. That's really lovely. A support group is a really important part. and. It's so valuable. So definitely finding those people that you have, um, you know, like-minded friendship group and a support network. I would absolutely agree. That's incredibly important in any career. In any career, support network for women is a big one. Like they can, you know, social scientists have studied that and say that when people got a network support behind them, they do better in science. That's incredible to hear. And I wanted to ask about one of your favorite or I suppose proudest moments you've had since starting with CSIRO. Well, I guess just still being in science after all these years is a proud moment every day because yeah, science is tough. Um, and um, it's been some times where I thought I will switch career to something else, but I'm still here. And so I'm just proud to be here and and try to do my best to do the best science I can to, you know, improve the health of the Great Barrier Reef or improve that knowledge of circulation around Tasmania and, you know, and go all the way to trickle down to the stakeholder and the manager of all those valuable reefs we've got around our, our continent. Um, it's just, you know, very good to wake up every morning and go and do a work where you're studying the ocean. That's really nice to hear that I think you feel like there's a, I suppose, a purpose to your work and that's a big driver for you. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's when you're a scientist in a sense, you, you just, you're passionate about your work. You're passionate about what you do. You've got a very strong sense of purpose and, um, you know, you want, you want to do a difference in a sense. You want to be part of, of um, changing the world to a better world and uh, give a better world to, you know, my children and the other generation. And, and you sort of feel like you're doing this every day or you're trying to. You know, a very good friend and colleague at work, after we stop um, our lunch break every day, is always saying, OK, now we stop our lunch and we go back, save the world. And that's sort yes. of, you know, it's it's. It's a bit of an exaggeration, of course, but that's sort of what we feel deep down, like we're trying to to make it for a better world for everybody. 